I want to echo Scott's words and thank him for his. Uh, surely last week was uh, a very monumental moment in the life of this congregation, I think, for honest uh, admission and confession about our lives. And uh, I'm just so reminded of Pastor Jen Kim, who is the pastor of uh, All Nations Church in uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota. I had the privilege of going to visit with him and his church when I was on my last sabbatical. And uh, I was there for the service where he said, if uh, the person up front is not giving a testimonial, and he meant that as a confession, if you are not giving a testimonial somewhere in your preaching, you are uh, doing a disservice to your congregation. And I think he even went as far as saying you're lying to them. Uh, so if we're not honest up here, we won't be honest out there and out there. So I really, really appreciate those of you, either through the prayer time or through the sermon time, were able to be honest. And I hope that conversation continues. But let's turn to uh, another place of honest dialogue, right, David? Uh, your uncomfortableness about the scripture was mine also. Uh, I frequently said, and I am sure to your chagrin, I say this, that the work of diversity uh, is easy when it comes to those things that we have already done Maybe not perfectly, but fairly well. You know, those things we've been working on so hard for years and years and years, even before I got here. Uh, when you all first chose to have women elders and you said gender is not uh, a defining factor in faithfulness. Uh, when you all made sure that this building began to be accessible and invited into leadership people with different abilities. Uh, and said, that is not going to define who is part of the kingdom of God. And of course, uh, we've been working on our, uh, our uh, sexual orientation policies and making sure this is an open and affirming church. Uh, even when that becomes a little uncomfortable and someone is more open and affirming than we imagined the person could be. <laughs> and then last week, of course, we dealt with uh, the issue that our, our nation and our world has such a difficult time talking about, and that's race and ethnicity and how those great divides ought not to be great divides. So I say to you again today, those are the easier ones to, to work with. I know that makes you want to cringe because then you want to whisper to the person next to you, if those are the easy ones, I can't imagine the hard ones. But we know what the hard ones are because we know it's what our nation is divided over right now. Um, one of the ones that we dealt with a little bit when we talked about community a year ago, and that is differing philosophical approaches to life, usually theological or political. Uh, where the great divides, talk about there not being a middle class. There's no middle class when it comes to politics. There's no middle of the road when it comes uh, to religion, or at least it feels that way in the discussion out in the world. I think that's one of those really difficult places that we are only just now beginning to talk about. What does it mean to have a Republican sitting next to a Democrat sitting next to a Libertarian and singing the same hymn fervently together? What does that mean? And can it happen? Can we have evangelicals, neo-evangelicals, uh, progressives, uh, Unitarians, and diehard disciples of Christ uh, taking communion together next to each other and feeling good about the fact that the person sitting next to you is taking that communion with you. But today, because of this scripture that was kind of plopped into my lap by the lectionary, and you know the lectionary is that kind of cycle of readings that we pastors go to when we're not sure what we want to preach about, or we want to make sure that we're not always preaching the same thing, and it's that difficult place of class and money and economics that I think our congregation is, is beginning to talk about, but I don't think that we, we, we talk about it quite enough. So I thought today we would talk a little bit about it. And part of the problem with talking about these things is that our environment outside these walls has been made so toxic. So toxic, in fact, that to say we can have different opinions about this is to say you've already given in. And anyone who is of the position that you might be a part of says, you're a traitor. 
because you even want to talk about it with someone on the other side or in a different position. Well, that's why I think we try to do things differently here. The widening the circle forums that we have occasionally are a place where you take a, an issue that's not top in the news right now so that it's not so, so hyper-sensitive uh, and find a creative way to talk about it. It's also why I think it's so important for us to have these city council or these, these uh, community discussions that the city councilman uh, has so graciously brought into our sanctuary. Um, because I remember a day not too long ago where those conversations uh, came close to fistfights. Uh, and there's still a lot of tension, but I think in this space, which he calls sometimes the Switzerland of the near west side, that we say we're going to do it differently. Well, having said that, Scripture pushes us a little hard on this one. Uh, I don't know if you listened closely to what David was reading, but um, this, these issues of class and economics and money uh, in Scripture are really pushed to the limit. They seem to be very, very clear. The language that 1 Timothy uses is pretty strident about the wealthy and how the wealthy stand on a precipice of their faith. Uh, and how uh, those who are poor and those who are, are in need uh, are really the focus of God's attention and love. Uh, that's really hard to hear. Now, if that weren't enough, I don't know if you know, but the lectionary always teams up a Old Testament scripture, a psalm, a gospel, and an epistle, and kind of puts those all together, and, you know, we pastors choose which one we're going to work on, right, Carrie? So I thought, well, maybe the other ones are better. So Amos 6 is worse. <laughs> Alas for those who lie on beds of ivory and lounge on their couches and eat lambs from the flock and calves from the stall, who sing idle songs to the sound of the harp and like David improvise on instruments of music, who drink wine from boil, bowls and anoint themselves with finest oils, but are not grieved over the destruction of Joseph. Therefore, they shall now be the first to go into exile, and the revelry of the loungers will pass away. You could just hear a street corner preacher saying that. The revelry of the loungers will pass away. So I turned to the Psalms. Psalms are always beautiful, right? Always very, very kind and nice. Um, and this is a little easier to take, but Psalm 146 reminds us, Do not put your trust in princes, in mortals, in whom there is no help. When their breath departs, they return to the earth. On that very day, their plans perish. So you go to the gospel, right? We're disciples of Christ. We go to the gospel. That's always the easy one. So I turn to Luke 16. But it is that famous story of the rich man and Lazarus. You remember that. Not the Lazarus that died and was raised uh, to life, but the other Lazarus. Actually, the only one who gets a name in this story, which is another way of dissing the rich man. Um, and it's the story, it's this haunting tale of a rich man who, having received the good things throughout his earthly life, was sent to the fiery pit of hell. And poor Lazarus, who had to endure all manner of evil things in his lifetime, is now sitting in comfort for all eternity. And you know what the, the rich man does is he's trying to figure a way out of this situation. And so he asks, you know, if something can change and, and uh, God says, no, you have set this in place. This great chasm that is between you is something that you worked so hard on and, and earth and you're going to have to live with it for the rest of your life. And then he comes up with a little deal and says, well, if, if I can't get out of this hell, then tell Lazarus. Still ordering the help around. Tell Lazarus to go and tell my relatives what has happened because uh, I don't want it to happen to them too. And then those immortal words that, uh, that God says, they have Moses and the prophets. They should already know what to do. For even if a dead man rose from the dead to tell them what to do, they would not listen. Which is to say, even if our Lord Jesus Christ said it, people still will not listen. 
So, Scripture really puts this thing that we want to talk so calmly and so comfortably about, it puts it to the edge. It really pushes us to think in extreme terms. There's a pretty clear charge throughout Scripture that we need to avoid being infatuated with what we have. The material resources of our world, however much that might be, little, a bit, or a lot, we should never become infatuated with it. Because we risk losing our very soul in the process. And as frequently pointed out, the biblical phrase that we get in this uh, scripture text in 1 Timothy is not, money is the root of all evil, but the love of money is the root of all evil. And somehow we find some comfort in that. Oh, okay. Oh, whew, I'm off the hook. It's not money that's the, the root of all evil. It's the love of money. Of course, what Scripture is trying to say is that means everybody's in trouble. Everybody should worry about it. Whether you have money or not, it's the love of money. And you can be as poor as a, uh, as a church mouse and still have that love of money that will put your soul in jeopardy. The Bible is pretty consistent in its warnings about wealth and the love of wealth. But what's so maniacal about this is, as I was implying, that even those who don't have money get caught up in the whirlwind of wanting it. That's why I believe in our society that those who are super wealthy and wastefully rich are rarely called out for their over-the-top behavior because we have made their behavior the hallmark of what we all should seek to attain. Now, we'll joke about the Donald Trumps of this world, and we'll joke about some of those folks who really, you know, become a caricature of themselves, but don't we all kind of think that we all want to be up there? What is this with the lottery? All of us wanting so much to win the lottery. And I thank you for telling me that you will give 10%, maybe 15% to the church. And Randy, and Randy will put it in that uh, offering as quickly as he possibly can. But we all know what's underneath that is this bar has set really high. That this is what is normal. And any of us under that are always wanting, are always found wanting. I am reminded by Professor Christian Everhart that really helped me with this scripture quite a bit, that it's also helpful to remember when these scriptures were written. They are pushed to this extreme for a reason in this environment, and a lot of it is in the context of the Roman Empire in the first century CE, the only people who were wealthy were those who had to be in collusion with the Roman Empire. There was no other way. So everybody, the vast majority of people were just on this level plane, all working hard, all trying to do their best. And anybody who raised above that plane had to already be in some kind of a deal with the Roman Empire. So there's this kind of political uh, charge to it. So anytime in, in, in the New Testament, at least, you hear their talk about the wealthy, you need to have in the back of your mind someone who's already uh, colluded with the establishment. Someone who not only, uh, not only uh, wouldn't, be, wouldn't be someone that we would say pulled themselves up by the bootstraps. It wouldn't be someone who just simply worked hard for their money and, and they earned it. They had to have somehow been in collusion, in connection, in, in conversation with at least the powers that be. And so Christianity was a countercultural movement uh, and clearly was setting itself up against uh, the Roman Empire. Um, so what would you do to do that? You would talk more about equal distribution of power and money and resources. Um, it's conveyed in Acts as the New Testament church starts to be uh, formed. It's all about pooling resources and making sure, you know, no one gets too much and everyone has enough. And then there's that, that uh, breathtaking story of Ananias and his wife uh, who was, were found to hoard just a little bit too much. And they were struck dead on the spot. But Christian Eberhard reminds me that's not the whole story. You have to read a little bit more behind the lines but you discover that wealth isn't always a bad thing, going back to it's the love of money. 
because wealthy people were appreciated as benefactors in the early Christian tradition. Luke mentions that the women, several women who accompanied Jesus and the disciples, provided for them out of their resources. Because you kind of wonder, how did they get by these 12, 13 guys wandering around? Someone had to pay the bill when they walked out of the tavern. Um, Luke says some wealthy women were providing. That's a very positive image of wealth. Likewise, the Apostle Paul makes it very clear he's drawing upon the financial support of benefactors. Every place he travels, all of his missionary journeys... Uh, have to be paid for by somebody. He does some work as a tent maker, we understand, but really, uh, it went far beyond that. He needed the support of those in the communities he went to. So it's crucially important to think about the attitude of the person rather than the money or the resources themselves. Material wealth can get in the way of putting one's trust in God, and it can be a hindrance to following Jesus. And yet many of the church's ministries, and uh, David did a great job of naming that today in a very clear way, our ministries rely on your financial support. So finances can't be all bad. And relying upon finances isn't bad. That's how we get by in life. So the answer to this dilemma, I think, about talking about class and economics and money, is that very first sentence in the scripture today. Now, in the New Revised Standard Version, it says, There is great gain in godliness combined with contentment. That really intrigued me. Godliness combined with contentment. Now, godliness is kind of all those things we do to, to try and serve God and, and follow Jesus and, and, and be good Christians. You know, it's religion, piety, devotion. Um, earlier in 1 Timothy, uh, godliness has been recommended. Train yourself in godliness. For while physical training is of some value, godliness is valuable in every way. Holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. So godliness, being faithful, being spiritual, trying to enhance your spiritual journey is important. But in this scripture, it's linked with contentment. Contentment. Whatever our level of material or financial wealth might be, the key is where do our hearts lie? You can be as poor as can be and still be content. You can be as wealthy as you can be and be content. And vice versa. Where does your heart lie? To put it another way, in whom or in what do you trust? Contentment in whatever circumstances in life, life has far less to do with the amount of money in our wallets, how many inches our flat screen TV is on our wall, or how thick the stakes are in our refrigerator. Contentment is about being grounded. Grounded in something larger than ourselves, something that has more meaning, something that has staying power, other than just money, which we know is very fleeting. I think that that's why we're in community here. It's something larger than ourselves. I think that's why we're part of the universal church because we know it extends through time and distance. It's bigger than ourselves and it's always trying to seek a deeper meaning. I think that's why I, at least, worship God found in Jesus Christ. Because I do think that that's something bigger in life that does bring me great contentment and peace. It's why we gather here in this moment in worship, because we believe that contentment lies in something greater than ourselves as individuals. But having said that, it's a whole series of buts in this sermon, but having said that, I don't think that this focus on individual contentment is the only thing. Or the complete answer, because in the breadth of Scripture, it never leaves it on an individualistic level, this contentment. Contentment is never really fully realized if it's just me being content. We must be content for ourselves, but we must be restless for everyone else. We must always be eager for everyone else to have what they need, uh, to be fulfilled. 
So it's, it's a way of finding a simplicity for ourselves. Those beautiful words of the Sermon on the Mount about um, um, the, the birds of the air have uh, the food that they need and the flowers of the field are clothed. Uh, that's a lot about our personal contentment. But when we look at someone else who does not have enough, we must be as restless as we can be to find what they need to be healthy and happy. That's why my entire ministry is, is dedicated to weaving together this deep personal spirituality with spirituality with a passion of justice for others. It's not a, I believe it's a false dichotomy that too many churches perpetuate that say evangelism is over here and social justice is over here. I hate that because contentment in one necessarily needs contentment in the other. Being spiritual is not the opposite of being socially justice-minded. They go together. In fact, this is where diversity becomes almost magical and mystical. When you gather a group of folks together who are in content in their own lives, they found something and their hearts are at peace. And yet they are fiercely discontent. They are outraged at other folks not having that same peace and contentment, that same enoughness, that they have to do something to change the world. Whether it be come early on a Sunday morning and fill bags with good quality food, or if it means go out and picket some corporation because they're not doing what you think is right. The contentment that comes in our inner selves needs to be mirrored in our discontent for the world as it is so that others can be content as we are. And so in the words of 1 Timothy, it pulls together so nicely. They, they meaning us, are to do good, to be rich in good works, generous and ready to share, thus storing up for themselves, ourselves, the treasure of a good foundation for the future. So that they may take hold of the life that really is life. That's contentment and a restlessness for others who have not enough. I'm going to invite us to continue this conversation about class and economics. Because the October forum for widening the circle... We're bringing back those good folks from the mental health services that did such a great job talking to us about hospitality and homelessness. Remember we had such a great turnout? They're coming back and they're going to lead us in a discussion entitled, A Culture of Class. So I invite you to come to that. That's going to be on Monday, October 21st at 7 p.m. But now I invite you. Let us all stand as we conclude this service as best we are able and sing to our heart's content our closing hymn. And if you'd like to give your life to Jesus Christ or join this church, please come forward now while we all sing together.